Well, we've come to the end, the end of the first letter anyway. There's only a few verses left in Paul's first letter to Timothy. All kinds of instructions, all kinds of encouragement, but addressing primarily one major problem, the influence of false teachers in the churches in the city and the region of Ephesus. But along with that, a lot of encouragement to pray, how they conduct their worship services, um, looking for quality characteristics in their leaders, um, how to be involved in the life of the church, different groups of people in the church. I just feel like when we come to the end of 1 Timothy, Paul has addressed so many things with Timothy. It's like, of all the things that I want to say, here at least is what I have to offer you. But now it's time to come to the end. When he comes to the end, what's he going to say? How would you finish a letter? So let, let's suppose that you have written a letter to a close friend. And I know that these days it's text messaging and emails, but let's go back a few years and you took out a piece of paper and you wrote a letter to a very close friend. And you've written about the things, you, know, you talk about the weather and you talk about your life experiences and you talk about a variety of things and you've written them. How are you going to end your letter? What will you say? What will your finer, final words be? Well, when we get to the end of 1 Timothy, I almost feel like Paul is just finally stopping. He, he, almost, he doesn't stop abruptly, but he, he, it's not like he is working real hard to say, final words are this, final words are this, final words are this. All of a sudden, he's just done, and then he addresses Timothy. But it has a purpose, and we're going to find that out here in the next few minutes. But really what I want to talk about in these last few verses is, is something that I would say as a question in this way. How do we invest for the future? in an eternal kingdom. How about if I could convince you that if you would give me some of your money, I would invest it and I will guarantee you a significant return on your money. So I come to one of you and I say, you know, it, it, why don't you give me as much money as you can get together and I promise you, your investment will make a return many times over. So one of you comes to me and you hand me $50 or 1,500 rubles, and I say, that's all? I mean, that might be a lot of money for you, but I've guaranteed you a significant investment. Sorry, that's all I have. Another one of you comes to me and he says, well, I'll give you $100 or 3,000 rubles. And I say, well, that's a fairly significant amount of money, but that's all? I promise you, your, your investment is going to return 10 times 20 times what you give me. Can you find more money? Sorry. No, sorry. I talk to one more person among this group, and you come up to me and you give me $10,000 or 300,000 rubles, and I say, you believe, don't you? Yes, I believe. And you give me this major amount of money, and they say, I trust you. If you say the return is going to be 10 times or 20 times, I trust you here is everything that I have. What we're going to see Paul talking about to Timothy here is, is like making an investment, not with money per se, although it could be, but to say, I have an investment for you to make in eternity, in the kingdom of God, in people's lives, and you can invest the resources that you have. If I could say it in a point, this is what I would say. In this life, we're given certain things to invest. Identifying what they are is as important as how we invest them. In this life, we're given a certain amount of resources to invest. But identifying what those resources are as is, is as important as how we invest them. You say, what do you mean? Aren't you talking about money? I say, well, that's, that's one thing. Another resource we have is time. All of us are given a certain amount of days to live on this earth, some more than others. But you are given a certain amount of time, and you can invest that in kingdom kind of purposes. Uh, you're given a resource of relationships, some of you in your family, some of you at your work, some of you in your church. You invest in those relationships in a kingdom kind of way. And of course, there's financial investment. Taking what God has given us, investing it in a kingdom kind of way, is what he's talking about here. So he begins in verse 17, and I'd like to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 21, the last few verses of this book, this letter. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
verses 17 through 21 say this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, the storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Of all the things that Paul could have concluded this letter with, he chooses to talk about finances, about investment. We said that investment can include much more than finances, but his particular look is at the people in those congregations who do have a certain amount of resources. I don't know if you remember way back when we did our foundation digging for this first letter called 1 Timothy, but the city of Ephesus was largely known as a wealthy city. It's not hard to assume, and especially from this verse, that there were people in this church who had a great deal of financial resources. And Paul says, Timothy, as for the rich in this present age, those who live in this life, in the first century, in the Roman Empire, but here in the city surrounding Ephesus, he says, I want you to charge them. I want you to tell them strongly. I want you to meet with them. I want you to talk with them. And he says, I want you to tell them, don't be arrogant, but be humble. If there's a principle that I'd like to leave with you when it comes to financial matters or the ways in which God has blessed you, the first one I would give you from this verse is, be humble. You say, well, I wish I had enough money that being humble was a problem. Maybe most of you who are listening say, I'm so poor, I don't have anything to brag about. But there might be some of you who are listening whom God has really blessed financially in your work or in your business or in some kind of enterprise. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Paul's words through Timothy to you are, please don't be arrogant, be humble. Recognize that everything we have, everything we are is a gift from God. In fact, he goes further than that in not only just not being um arrogant, but to be humble. He says, beyond that, I want you not to set your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. When I was growing up, there were a number of families in our community with the same last name as mine. We were related to some closer than others, but there were two families. One of them had 12 children, and the other had 13. Huge families. I remember when they would come to church and they would pile kids into the vehicles and sometimes when they would go home, they would forget certain children and we would take one or two of them home because their families were so large. They had very little. But what they had, they shared. There was a humility about them. There was a generosity about them. My family, in contrast to that, we only had four children, which today is a large family. Back then, it wasn't a large family. But we had a certain amount of possessions. My dad did well as a farmer, and we had good equipment on our farm. We had a nice house. We had certain things to play with that some other kids didn't have. And I don't think I recognize that compared to these two very large families, we probably were rich. I didn't think about it that way. I just enjoyed the things that we had. But sometimes when I think about the difference between those two very large families and ours, I want to say to myself, what was my attitude with those things? Everything we have is a gift from God, but sometimes we don't treat it as a gift. We treat it as, well, I was entitled to that. If God has blessed you with finances, he says, I don't want you to be arrogant or proud. In fact, he says, I don't want you to set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. And that brings us to our second point. He says, I want you to be dependent. But I want you to depend on God himself. I don't want you to set your hopes on the stock market. I don't want you to set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Over the last four, five, six years, the American stock market, which was very high and people had invested a lot of money in, just crashed. And it went down about half of what it had been. 
my parents are a good example. It affected so many people. My parents were just average, middle-class American citizens. He was a farmer. He saved a good deal of money. He invested it in the markets. He was a godly man. And as they got to retirement age, mom and dad were going to be well taken care of. They could live in a different home and, and, and just live a secure life. And all of a sudden, the market began to go down, 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 down. And the amount of money that my father had saved up was now worth only half of what he had had before. What Paul would say to my father and to every one of us is, don't put your hope on the finances that you have in the bank or that you have invested in the stock market. He says, I want your hope to be in God, that if God happens to bless you with resources and finances, praise God. Use it wisely. Use it humbly, not arrogantly. But when the stock market crashes and when it went down, I didn't see a change in my father's faith at all. There was disappointment. They liked giving gifts to the children and to the grandchildren at Christmas time. Significant gifts, sometimes money, which just helped us in, in our own finances. And they said to us, we're sorry, kids. We, we're not able to give like we used to. We didn't get angry with God and say, if you would have let my parents have more money, then I would be happy. Instead, what we said to my parents was, Mom, Dad, you've been very generous with what you've given us before. We did not make the gift an expectation. We just appreciated it. Thank you for what you give. See, we learn to understand that God holds all things in, in the strength of his hand, in the power of his might, but that when we trust in our finances or in our personal security with what we have, we miss the God-centered, Christ-centered, gospel-centered nature of where our trust really lies. And so Paul says, I suggest that you have a healthy dependence on God and not on the amount of money that you have in your bank account. In fact, I like this description of God here in verse 17. It says, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Sometimes we have this idea that God is this miserly old man who gives us just enough to get by. And God gives us a little bit here, and he gives us a little bit there. In fact, what this verse is saying is quite the opposite. God is a generous God who gives us all things to enjoy, to savor, to praise, to turn it around into adoration for God. I want you to enjoy that. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on video, you don't see what I do between the class sessions. Some of my friends in America have sent uh, gifts along for the class, and I tell them how much Russians like American milk chocolate. So between a break in our class, I'll go to my bag and I'll break out another bag of milk chocolate. And everyone says, Spiceba, I say, Pajalsta, I'm glad to provide it. But we love chocolate. I love the way the fine and the expensive chocolate tastes. Like Mm, that is so good. I could let it melt in my mouth and it makes me happy and it pleases me. And, and I hope that the, that, that the students who are enjoying the chocolate, they have that same impression. Mm, it's such a wonderful gift. It tastes sweet. It tastes smooth. And I just love the taste of this gift of this chocolate. That's what he's saying about God, that when God gives us a gift, we don't go, I wish you could have given me more. It's so good. It's so rich. You're so generous, and, and you love us so much. You say, but Pastor Bruce, I, I, I would do that, but we're really struggling right now. We're in a very financially difficult time. How am I supposed to do that? I understand. A few years ago, we were having a very difficult time financially, just with a growing family and the church was paying us a salary, but we had this expense here and that expense there. And we're just like, Lord, what, what do you want us to do? You're a generous God. You provide for us. We have food and clothing, so thank you. But we're, we're, not, have, we're not being able to make this particular payment or, or catching up financially. And one day, a man walked up to me, and he, 
He held out his hand and he shook my hand. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. We appreciate you being the pastor of our church. We really love you. I said, thank you very much. And it felt funny in my hand. There was something in his hand as I was holding his. And when I pulled my hand away from his, there was a piece of paper in my hand. It was a check. I don't know if you write checks, but a check blank is a, a piece of paper, which is a note which tells his bank to pass on to me a certain amount of money. And after he, I didn't look at it at the moment, but after he left, I looked in my hand at the amount of this check and I go, this is the amount of need that we have in our family at this time. In talking to this man, uh, conversations like, how did you know that we needed this amount of money? He says, I didn't know. My wife and I just sat down and we began to talk and think about how we might just bless you. And so I wrote out this amount of this check and I give it to you as a gift of love. Thank you, Lord. The God who is generous and who loves to give and you say, Pastor Bruce, I wish someone would do that for me. I don't know how God's going to provide I wish that somehow we could meet all of our needs financially and food and clothes and your education and the provision for your children. Sometimes God allows us to suffer for a time so that our hunger for him is greater than our hunger for that particular possession. I don't know. I'm not trying to be simplistic. I'm not trying to be cavalier or try to dismiss your problems. I'm just saying God is not limited in the amount of ways in which he can provide but that it is about the eternal kingdom and laying up treasures in heaven that when he blesses us and when he provides for us, it turns to adoration and praise. And one day when we sit in his kingdom and he explains all things to us, we're going to say, you are an amazing God. You are worthy of praise. You provided for my need at my lowest point. You provided at this point and this point. I didn't understand it at the time, but I praise you because of what you have done. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. Let me ask you a question. The man who gave me the gift in the handshake, do you think he had the greatest pleasure or do you think I had the greatest pleasure? Honestly, I don't know. There have been a few times where I have given gifts to people myself and it pleases me so much as the giver, I think that I got more pleasure to give than that person had to receive. The reason I say that is when God gives you a gift and when he provides for you, he's not sitting there in heaven and go, boy, that wasn't any fun. I'm not sure that they'll even appreciate it. I think God is so happy at the privilege he has to give to you. His joy is almost inexpressible. I think it's greater than the joy that we have in receiving. And all of that falls under the heading of when we are dependent upon God, he blesses us in ways that we can't even ask or imagine. We had this... Uh, uh, camp director a number of years ago. He's passed away now. He's with the Lord. He was one of my mentors. He was one of the most godly, faithful men that I have ever known. He and his wife as camp directors were always very poor, but God would always provide at just the moment of need. And so when the camp would come together and I would be a camper, so I was a young boy, and we had a swimming area that we had to get in a bus and drive a few miles away to this swimming area, this lake. And on the way, he, he had this big old cowboy hat, and he had this nice deep voice, and he would say, let's sing some songs. And the kids would go, ah, I don't want to sing some songs. And there was one song that I remember him singing to this day. I doubt that any of you have heard of it, but it went like this. I am satisfied, I am satisfied. Satisfied to know that my Savior loves me so. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. Satisfied to know he loves me. I'm not the greatest singer, but that was the tone of it. 
And we would sing this on this bus. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. We get discouraged. We get tired. We get grumpy. I get grumpy. And those words of that song from this man with his old beat up cowboy hat, I am satisfied. Satisfied to know that my Savior loves me so. He loves me. He adores me. And he wants me to love him in that same way. I just, so many times that song comes back to me again. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.